Good evening. Thank you so much for being here this evening and participating in this most important conversation. I'm Natalie Fitzgerald, President of the Board of the Women's International Studies Center, or WISC, and we are really proud to bring you tonight's discussion. Some of you may not have heard of WISC because we're a relatively young organization, only two years old. So I'd like to tell you just a little bit about us. The genesis of an inspiration for WISC was the life work of three remarkable women, mother, daughter, and granddaughter, who achieved enormous accomplishments, but who lived their lives relatively unknown in spite of all that they achieved. These three generations of women lived in a house on Asakia Madre, which is now the headquarters of WISC. Their life work was support of the arts, business, science, cultural preservation, and philanthropy. And those are now the disciplines that WISC advances through our fellowships, our workshops, and our symposia. And events like this one tonight, which we hope will facilitate understanding and dialogue. WISC's mission is to inform, inspire, and enable women around the world to achieve their full potential. And like the three women, WISC engages with cross-generational, extremely important, cross-cultural and interdisciplinary groups in the pursuit of that mission. Tonight is the first of our EDGE series, and EDGE stands for Engaging Dialogue on Gender Equity and as one of a series of presentations WISC is convening during our 2015 programming. Our focus this year is on trending and relevant topics. We are covering with world-class presenters and in-depth the subjects of unconscious bias, social change, and gender equity, issues that matter for each and every one of us. We strive to identify the issues and the problems, but most importantly, we seek to generate positive takeaway thoughts and actions. Our next two events in August during our Women in the Arts event, Women in the Arts Week, focus on what it takes to be successful as a woman artist and on the current status of women in the arts and their roles in social change. And in September, we are addressing first the impact of women activists on social justice movements, and finally, Title IX and its impact on gender equity today. All the WISP programs engage big questions that have important ramifications, not only for Santa Feans and New Mexicans, are you all hearing this? Yeah. But for the wider world at large. We are creating space for community conversations around science, social issues, the arts and culture, and diversity, all of which play such a significant role in the well-being of our communities and our economy. You can find more information about WISC and our upcoming programs in the brochure we gave you tonight, or which I believe there are some outside. Please take a look at them and join us in the existing, in the upcoming programs. An event like tonight requires a lot of effort and dedication, and so I want to thank our board of directors for their untiring efforts, and especially our events coordinator, Sarah Kennedy. Would those of you who are on the board please stand and be recognized so people can see who you are? A special thanks to Sandy Blakesley, who was the board leader for this program, but who could not be with us this evening. Her daughter is about to have a baby. And we are so grateful to have as our speaker the renowned Jennifer Raymond, who was one of our stars at our symposium last year. Jennifer is standing over there. Um, you'll learn more about Jennifer. You'll learn more about Jennifer in a... In, about Jennifer Raymond in a moment, who will be introduced by Jennifer Dunn, Vice President for Science for SFI. And we really want to thank SFI for co-sponsoring this event with us. And just one final thing, 
We do amazing programs and we're a very young organization. We need you to sign up as members. It is absolutely crucial. We cannot do it without you. And as someone said to me just over the weekend, no donation is too small or too large. So please sign up as members and have a look at the upcoming programs. They are truly extraordinary. I won't go into them because there's so much to say about them. And finally, it's my honor to turn the microphone over with thanks to Mayor Javier Gonzalez, who's joined us to welcome all of you and to introduce Jennifer Dunn. Thank you so much. Good evening, Santa Fe. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. And part of what makes Santa Fe so special and such a vibrant place is the dialogue that occurs when our community comes together. So I want to welcome all of you here tonight. Events like this one are always reassuring to me on some level. Not that it's reassuring that we are all on some level biased, but that we take the time to come together and confront those biases head on, unafraid of our own human frailty. And that tonight, at least, that conversation is happening here in this community that we all love. That is incredibly, it is reassuring that it is happening. It reminds me that no matter what challenges we face, as long as we remain committed to honest conversation and collaboration, we can overcome them. It amazes me it, it's amazing to me that just spending a few moments considering biases leads you to countless examples in our daily lives. When Hillary Clinton gets more media coverage for her latest outfit or her order at Chipotle than her latest policy proposal. When women are only 4.5% of Fortune 500 CEOs and only 20% of the United States Senate. When a committee gets formed or a task force appointed and somehow, some way, Everyone seems to be the same approximate age, gender, or ethnicity. Now, Santa Fe is well known as a progressive town, but we are not immune. When one of our own throws a banana on stage at a black comedian show, but claims it isn't racist. As the debates over the Confederate flag rage in communities across our country, some of the biases we are seeing now aren't even all that unconscious. Now, I love to talk about Santa Fe as one family. And part of being a family means having the tough conversations. That's why you are here tonight. And while no one expects to walk out of here with this problem solved, each moment we spend engaged in this with one another is one step closer to a world where at the very least, we have the human self-awareness to recognize that faults ingrained in us and take the action necessary to check them. So thank you. Your dedication and your presence here tonight is a reminder of our social responsibility to one another. And you can be proud to be part of the solution when so many groups are shying away from this level because of the difficult engagement. I'd also like to thank Natalie and the rest of the Women's International Study Committee, whom we are proud to say are doing work with international implications right here in our own community at an Aseca Madre home that housed three generations of incredible Santa Fe women. I'm honored to be here this evening to meet and to get to know all of you uh, once again and also to introduce a very special guest. Jennifer Dunn is the Vice President for Science at the Santa Fe Institute, which, like the Women's International Study Committee, is another feather in Santa Fe's research cap. The Santa Fe Institute is a transdisciplinary scientific research institute that seeks to discover the common fundamental principles that underlie complex physical, computational, biological, and social systems. They like to say that researchers associated with the Santa Fe Institute are asking and answering big questions that matter to science and society. And since, one of my, and since it's one of my favorite places in Santa Fe, I do know that that's the truth. Jennifer's expertise lies at the interface of ecology, physics, and network theory. And this fall, she will be giving SFI's 2015 Stanislaw Ulam Memorial Lecture Series on September 15th and 16th on the topics the web of life, the hidden order of complex ecosystems, and the ecological human. 
The lectures are free and open to the public and will be held here at the James A. Little Theater. I certainly will try to be there if I can, and I want to encourage all of you to go as well. I will just add that having been tremendously successful in the male-dominated profession, she knows a little something about bias and has overcome her fair share of it to get where she is today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Jennifer Duke. She developed and was advisor for the Neuroscience Graduate Program Senior Student Super Friends Colloquium. She has served on the Neuroscience Graduate Program Committee, the Medical Scientist Training Program Committee, the Advisory Committee to the Provost on Postdoctoral Affairs, and the School of Medicine Task Force on Funding Courses and Teaching. And, uh, as if that's not all enough, she's currently developing the systems neuroscience component of the new cur core curriculum for the Stanford Neurosciences Graduate Program, which she will be co-directing beginning this fall. However, what brings us all here tonight is Dr. Raymond's extensive and tireless commitment to gender-related issues that affect the experience and careers of both women and men in STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. From 2012 to 20, uh, 2014, she served as an associate dean in the Office of Diversity and Leadership at the Stanford School of Medicine. In this role, she developed strategies to create more flexible career paths, for faculty to better accommodate family responsibilities and other outside interests in order to recruit and retain a more diverse faculty. The innovation of those programs was recognized by an award from the Sloan Foundation and was chronicled in scholarly journals such as uh, Nature, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and the Harvard Business Review, as well as in national news outlets such as the New York Times and Washington Post. Dr. Raymond has also created several ongoing programs at Stanford, including a monthly discussion group on gender issues in neuroscience, a course on empowering emerging scientists through the use of executive coaching techniques, and a mini course on gender and science. For these and other STEM education-related activities, she was awarded uh, the 2013-14 Stanford Biosciences Excellence in Diversity Award. She was also a faculty fellow at the Clayman Institute for Gender Research, and a member of the advisory board for the Center for the Advancement of Women's Leadership. She regularly consults on women in STEM for a variety of institutions and has done extensive outreach um, related to gender issues in science, including pieces in nature and science, and uh, through radio, print, and film interviews, and via public lectures such as this. Um, finally, perhaps the most salient fact about Dr. Raymond, for this talk in particular, is that while in graduate school she played water polo which is an incredibly physically challenging sport, and she played it on a men's team. She considers that experience some of the best preparation she had for being a woman in science. <laughs> Tonight she will speak on Unpended Lives. Women's issues of any kind. 
Um, and so I want to start by sharing, in fact, if I go back to college, I took a political philosophy course, and there I read that women's issues are the one set of issues on which people move to the left as they get older. On most issues, people get more conservative with age. On women's issues, they um, get more progressive. And I remember very distinctly thinking, that will never happen to me. <laughs> and so I want to share with you why it did happen to me and why I hope it will happen to you if it hasn't already. So here I have what the demographics looked like, the gender demographics in my field of neuroscience during the time that I was training. We've largely overcome the explicit bias that had kept my mother from pursuing a career. Women were catching up in the workforce in many different ways. In neuroscience, we had a very strong pipeline and still have a strong pipeline of women, much more than some of the other sciences. So uh, we've had 45 to 55% of PhDs in neuroscience going to women for, um, since the mid 80s, so for about 20 years. And so everything was looking good. I felt like this gender problem had been solved thanks to all the work that women did in the previous generations. And so I could focus on the neuroscience research that I loved. But after a while, I couldn't help but notice that the women, my female colleagues, were dropping out at an alarming rate. And it wasn't just the women around me, but if I looked at the national numbers on what was happening for women in neuroscience, um, it, it mirrored what I was seeing personally. So although about half the PhDs have been going to women in neuroscience for many years, we're losing women at the transition from the PhD to the postdoc, which is the next stage in the career path. And we're losing women still at about twice the rate of men at this transition. And then they just progressively drop off at every rate. Now, for a while, at, at, at every level as you go up the path. But while I was training, it looked like we were making good progress. And you could imagine that we just needed all of those women who were getting their PhDs to percolate up through the pipeline, and we'd be at 50-50. Um, but we're losing women at the transition, and so although between 1986 and 1998 we were making about 10% gains at the assistant professor, full professor level, big gains at the postdoc level, if we look at the postdoc level in 1998, it was 38%. 13 late, years later, in 2011, which are the latest numbers we have from the Society for Neuroscience, 38%. No progress in over a decade. And although we were, had been making these good gains at the assistant professor and, and full professor level in um, the 80s and 90s, more recently, these curves have been flattening out. We've been making 10% gains in these 12 years, and then only 4% gains in the next 13 years at the full professor level, only 2% gain at the assistant professor level. And so if we were to keep going at this rate and just extrapolate out these curves, we might expect to reach 50-50 at the assistant professor level by the year 2117. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I am not nearly that patient. Because these are talented women, I knew, women with the capacity to solve some of the big problems we're working on in neuroscience, diseases that many people are suffering from. And these numbers that I'm showing you and trends in neuroscience parallel what you see if you look at almost any competitive field. Women now make up approximately 50% of the total workforce, but are highly underrepresented in any of the leadership positions or the most competitive fields. So for example, if you look at Fortune 500 companies, women make up only about 17% of the board members, and that number has not moved in about a decade. If you look at the wage gap for women, women make about three quarters of what men make. That has not moved in over a decade. And, in some, and this is true almost any measure you choose to look at. In some fields, like in computer science, there's actually been a backslide. So in what year do you think the most computer science degrees at the undergraduate level went to women? 1986, very close. 1984, 85, right, mid 80s. 38% of degrees in the mid-80s in computer science went to women. And now, 18%. So more disturbing than the absolute numbers about the representation of women are the trends 
all the numbers seem to be suggesting that our progress is stalled. And so we're not going to achieve gender parity for our daughters, our granddaughters, maybe not even our great-granddaughters, unless we take active steps and intervene. Another way to put it, we're not going to achieve gender parity for anyone who's currently alive <laughs> unless we do something. So what's, what's the problem? You know, the laws changed in the 60s. Explicit sexism is not extinct, but it's largely been reduced. Uh, the, thing, the main factor that seems to be limiting women's progress at this point is a different form, a, a more subtle but very pervasive form of bias against women that we call unconscious or implicit bias. And um, I'll tell you a bit more about what this is. Most of us have a, an unconscious tendency to view women as less competent in many domains. Um, you may not think you have this, but there's a test that can help you determine whether you might have it or not. I hope some of you had a chance to take it before coming here tonight. If you haven't, let me just briefly explain what this test is. It was developed by researchers at Harvard, Greenwald and Banaji and their colleagues. And it's designed to measure your, your automatic tendency to associate different concepts. And it does this by having you sort words and measuring how fast and how accurate you are, with the idea that if you tend to associate concepts more closely, you'll be faster and more accurate. So the way the test works is a word pops up on your computer screen, and it could be a male word like uncle, father, brother, or it could be a female word, aunt, daughter, grandmother. Um, it could be a science word like physics, chemistry, or math, or a liberal arts word like poetry, art, or literature. And in one condition, you're asked to push a button on the left if it's a male word or a science word, and push a different button if it's a female word or a liberal arts word. In another condition, you're asked to associate female words with science words and male words with liberal arts words. So some of you took the test. How did it go? I hear some giggling. I heard one great. <laughs> How many of you um, got a result that suggested you, have, you, you found it easier to associate women with science? Show of hands. See one hand. Maybe there's more that I can't see because of lights. Very few. How how many of you had a tendency to associate men with science? More. And how many of you either didn't take the test or just don't want to admit whether? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you took the test and you don't like your score, um, try not to be so hard on yourself. Tens of thousands of people around the world have taken this test, and the vast majority have. Um, a result that suggests they have a tendency to associate men with science, a bias to view science as something that's for men. And this test correlates with real world outcomes. So um, because so many, it's online, so many people around the world have taken it, they can look at the average scores for the different countries and correlate that with performance of eighth graders on math and science standardized tests. And they found that this implicit association test, which you can take in 10 minutes, if you haven't taken it, I urge you, it's a very interesting experience. Um, but this quick test is a good predictor of how well um, the girls will do relative to the boys in the eighth grade science and math classes. Very important to point out that men and women tend to have the same biases. Women also tend to associate science with men. Um, and, and there's another test that looks at career family and gender. Um, and we all tend to associate careers with men, including women. Um, so I'm a woman in science. Um, I've been working for several years now to try to increase the representation of women in science. My uh, belief is that women can be outstanding scientists. And yet, when I took this test, I didn't even need to wait for my score. I could feel how much harder it was for me to associate women with science. You know, I was hoping it would, I, I knew it would probably turn out that way. I was hoping it would, uh, but it did. And then I keep taking it, hoping it will change everything. <laughs> and it's pretty stable. So this is, um, this is not about conscious beliefs. This is not about what I really 
consciously hold to be true and value. Um, this is about unconscious beliefs that we've developed um, based on our experience with the world. Now, more disappointing than my own results is that um, my 10-year-old daughter took the test, and she had a tendency to associate women with family and men with careers. And um, so we're very effectively transmitting our biases about what are appropriate roles for men and for women to the next generation. So like the statistics about women in the workplace, the fact that young people, as well as the older generations, tend to share the same biases suggests that this is not something that's just going to passively go away. We're going to need to do something to change it. And my daughter um, described what the experience of taking the test was like. She said, as I was taking the test, I could tell that I was going to do better with women and family. I didn't want to do better. I was trying to do the same, but I just couldn't. And then she added, I was conscious of my unconscious. Okay, so she's the kid of a scientist. <laughs> but I think this is a really nice description of what the point of this test is to help you experience what's happening in your unconscious brain. Um, and very important also to point out that we have lots of different kinds of biases um, that many of us share, not just bias about gender roles, but we have, ten, most of us have an unconscious bias against people who have dark skin, who are short, who are overweight, who are elderly, homosexual, it's on and on the list of unconscious associations we make between these physical characteristics and what we believe to be true about people. And these, these unconscious beliefs have an important effect in the workplace. Um, as shown by the study done by a group at Yale, which they titled The Myth of Meritocracy. They took resumes, uh, a single resume, for a student applying for an entry-level lab position, and they sent it to science professors around the country, and they asked them to rate the quality of this applicant. And everybody got one resume. It was identical, except half of the professors got the resume with the name John on it, and the other half got the resume with the name Jennifer on it. This one hits very close to home. <laughs> so what happened is that when the name was John, the applicant was rated as more competent, that's the blue bar, compared to when Jennifer's name was on it, uh, rated as more hireable if it had a male name, and also, when the experimenters asked the professor, would you be willing to talk to this student and offer them some advice, even if you don't want to hire them, they were more willing to provide mentorship to the male applicant. Again, same results, whether it was a male professor or a female professor who was rating the applicants. Very important to, to recognize that Gender bias is not something that men do to women. This is something that we all do because of the way we have experienced our, our culture. And so if the, uh, the, the credentials are perfectly identical, the male candidate is rated as more competent. Another way of saying it is that the woman has to be better to be rated as the same. And so a nice analogy I've heard used is that Everybody's on the treadmill, but the women's treadmill is going a little faster. She has to run faster just to be perceived as going at the same pace. Even worse, and I'm going to get to some good news <laughs> eventually, but even worse is that because women have the same biases about women and, um, and their competency and what they're good at, uh, we can turn this bias to view women as less competent against ourselves. And so in this experiment, the experimenters um, gave a bunch of Asian women a math test. And for some of the women, before they took the test, they gave them a fairly subtle reminder of the fact that they're Asian. And those women did quite well on the test, consistent with the stereotype that Asians are good at math. But in the other randomly assigned half of Asian women, they reminded them of their gender before they took the test, and they did much worse. So women have these biases. We can turn them against ourselves, and, and that causes self-doubt. But not only self-doubt, it can actually affect performance. 
So gender bias is in many ways a self-fulfilling prophecy. Where does it come from? Here's where we get to talk about brain a bit. Um, these biases are learned. So this is an illustration of that. This is an experiment where the researchers asked kids, school age, elementary school age kids, to draw scientists. And the youngest kids, you know, about a little more than half drew a man, but 42% drew a woman. Um, but the older kids drew, as they aged, more and more, they were likely to, when they asked to draw scientists, <coughs> draw a man. So we are teaching our children that a scientist should be a man. They're not born thinking that. They learn it as they experience the world. But this is not the kind of learning that we normally think of as happening in a classroom, explicit kinds of learning. This is what we call implicit learning, which happens just through our experience, sometimes not in an effortful way, usually, sometimes without us even realizing that it's happening. And we've known since the work of Brendan Milner in the 1950s that there are different kinds of learning and memory that depend on different brain structures. And her discovery of this came by working with patients who were profoundly impaired. They had damage to the parts of the brain that support what we call explicit learning and memory. This is the kind of memory that lets and, and learning that lets you answer the question, who's the president of the United States? Um, they had damage to this memory system in the brain, and they, for example, had the same doctors working with them for many, many weeks, and the same scientists, but they never learned who they were. These were highly, what we call amnesic patients. But what Dr. Milner discovered is that these same patients that couldn't tell you what they had for breakfast had other kinds of learning and memory that were perfectly intact, perfectly normal. And some of the first evidence came from having them do more physical tasks, like um, trace a figure by looking in a mirror when you can't see your hand. Um, but subsequent research showed that many different kinds of learning and memory were spared in these patients, including the task I show here, where researchers give sometimes a research animal, sometimes a human, a series of pairs of objects, and randomly assign one object in each pair to be the correct choice. And the job of the patient or the subject is to figure out through trial and error which is the correct one. So they have to pick one, and then they're told that was correct or that was not correct. So they're given asparagus and a guy with glasses, they guess which is right, they get the feedback, they go on to the next pair, apple glasses, pick one, okay, that one was right. And they keep doing this in several sessions. Most of us would learn this through explicit learning, by trying to remember, through effortful, effortful practice. OK, I think last time I picked apple and that was wrong, so I'm going to pick glasses. Um, and by doing that, we can learn this rather quickly and get to almost 100% in just a few sessions of practice. If you give the patients just a few sessions, they're still almost at chance. But uh, what this group uh, from Larry Squire's lab discovered is if they kept training the patients, they could eventually learn and get almost to 100% as well. The difference is it took longer, but also that if you ask the normal subjects, well, how did you know which one was correct? They say, well, because you keep bringing me into the lab, I make me guess, I guess. You the, the patients, had no memory at all of having done the task. They thought they had never done it. They had no explicit memory of ever even trying. Um, they were actually surprised when they started getting a bunch right. They were like, hey, I, <laughs> hey I'm on a lucky streak. Uh, they had no idea uh, that they had done it before. And yet, a different, less conscious, automatic learning system had been allowing them to acquire the information and use it to guide their behavior. And the researchers included some really cool quotes from the subjects in their paper. So um, one of the subjects, when they asked, well, what strategy were you using for choosing the correct object? You're very good at this. And he said, it's just up here. It seems like it's up here, up there, and comes down and out. <laughs> and so then the researcher said, well, do you say to yourself, I remember seeing that one? And he said, no, 
It just seems that's the one. It just knows. Very similar from the other patient. He said, I can't say memory. I just feel this is the one. It's just jumping out at me. I'm the one. I'm the one. I keep wanting to pick it. It's not such a far stretch to go from these kinds of results and think about how this implicit learning system that allows the patients to do this might also be contributing to our biases. We go through life, we are repeatedly exposed to associations of science male, science male, science male, this happens over and over again in our direct experience, in the books we read, in the media. And so after many, many, many of these, being exposed to this so many times, if we're asked to choose a scientist, our implicit learning system is going to be saying, he's the one. He's the one, pick him. Right? And in fact, it was this kind of research on really basic forms of learning and memory that inspired the researchers at Harvard to hypothesize that maybe this kind of implicit learning system was contributing to social behavior as well and to develop the implicit association test to look for that. Okay, so now we get to the good news. Most of us, I think, really truly really want to be fair. Um, we're not happy to learn that we have these biases, but if we're aware of the bias, uh, you can use conscious strategies to overcome it. You can think of our biases as mental habits. Um, and just like you can with physical habits, like biting your nails, if you're aware that you do it, you can use the more thoughtful, rational, deliberate brain systems to try to develop strategies to overcome and limit the extent to which these habits control your behavior. Like I emphasize, if, because as I said, most of us don't want to be like this. We truly want to be fair. We have a hard time believing that bias could be influencing our decisions, could be influencing the department that I work in, my university, and so uh, we really resist the idea. And as Calvin said, it's not denial. I'm just very selective about the reality I accept. <laughs> And this study that I told you about where scientists were asked to, to review a resume and the reaction to that study is a really good illustration of this strong desire to deny that we have bias. So um, many people when this was published, many scientists that I know, neuroscientists, were shocked and appalled. But anyone who knew some of the social science literature probably wasn't so shocked, because lots of similar studies have been done previously. Take a resume, put a man's or a woman's name on it, people tend to choose the man. Um, it had been done where if you put um, on a woman's resume something that shows she's a mother, like president of the PTA instead of president of the Neighborhood Association, she's rated as less competent, offered much less salary, less likely to be hired. Um, the same holds if you put a Caucasian sounding name versus a different ethnic sounding name. Um, it's been shown in real world situations. The classic example, very striking example, is when orchestras started using a screen to keep the people doing the auditions uh, from seeing who was playing. They noticed they started to hire more women, suggesting that beforehand, if they could see it was a woman who was playing, somehow her music didn't sound as good. Okay, so. Overwhelming, and those are just a few of many, many studies of this kind have been done showing that under most conditions, there's a strong tendency for many of us to exhibit gender bias. <clears throat> and so when I first saw this study, I wondered, well, why did they bother doing that kind of thing again? It's been done, it's been done. Uh, why did they have to do it and send it to science professors? Well, I later learned that one of the authors would talk to some of her science professor colleagues about all of the social science research, and she found that often they would respond by saying, oh, I would never do that. That's terrible. I would never do that because I'm a scientist. I'm trained to be objective. Well, it turns out that scientists are people too, and just like everyone else, we are vulnerable to having biases 
based on physical traits, influence how we judge people. And yet, we still do this, um, even after that study was published, which is correct, but even after this study was published with scientists, when I talked to my science professor colleagues about it, they were still looking for an out. Right, so they would say things like, well, did that study include biology professors? <laughs> yes, it included biology professors. Well, you know, the resume was for an entry level person. It wouldn't happen if it was a faculty, a resume for a faculty job. Well, yes, other studies, another study's resume was for a faculty job. Oh. Well, did they send it to anyone in Palo Alto? <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I mean, it became almost a sport to watch how people would really contort to try to think of the reasons why this would not apply to them. Because this is really, most of us really don't want to be this. Um, it, it conflicts directly with values that we hold about being fair, um, and so we really try to find a reason why it doesn't apply. And our conscious brain, our more rational brain, is very good at doing cover-up work for our implicit unconscious system. And making reasonably, reasonable sounding excuses for the work that the bias is doing. And there's a study that really beautifully illustrates this, where there were subjects were presented with two candidates for a police chief job, one male and female, one had more education, but one had more experience, was more streetwise. If the man was the one who had more education, the subjects reported that they thought education was a more important criterion for hiring a <laughs> But of course, if the woman had more of the education, then people didn't think education was so important. So they call this constructing criteria. We change the criteria that we use to define merit in order to make excuses for that gut feeling that's driving our choices, which is our implicit bias. Very interesting part of this study is that they showed that the more objective people thought they were, the more likely they were to show this effect of changing the criteria to fit the male candidate. So, beware. And, this shows that the goal of meritocracy is laudable, right? Extremely laudable. I'm all in on that. But the myth that we actually have a meritocracy is dangerous and can actually move us further away from that goal. Moreover, if we want to deny or question whether there's bias, then the only other possibility, but if, if, if there's no bias and yet we look at our organization, and there aren't that many women at the top of it, or maybe sometimes at any level, um, then the only alternative explanation is that there's a problem with the women. They must not be willing or able to do the things that the men are doing to succeed. So I want us all to be good scientists and look at this alternative possibility. So in particular, we we'll the question, are there differences between male and female brains that can explain the gender disparities we see throughout our society? This is a human brain. Do you think it's a male brain or a female brain? <laughs> you know? This one's cut open so you can see the inside. And just, you know, neuro 101, the outer part here is called the gray matter. This is where the cell bodies are, the neurons that make up the brain. On the inside, we have the white matter that contains Parts of the cell axons that go out, they're like the wires that connect neurons to different parts of the brain. Is this a male brain or a female brain? Someone say female? They're the same. I'm a neuroscientist. I have no idea. Okay. Because male and female brains are so similar, you could take any neuroscientist off the street and they would be very hard pressed by looking at it and yet, last week I went poking around on the web just to see what was out there about male and female brains, and you can find some pretty wild stuff. <laughs> In just a few minutes, I found this on more than one website, on several 
several websites that male brains contain about 6.5 times more gray matter, sometimes called thinking matter, than women, whereas female brains have more than 9.5 times as much white matter, the stuff that connects there is parts of the brain than male brains. Totally, completely, not even close to the truth, and yet it was repeated on multiple websites. And again, without looking very hard, I found many other examples where the data were probably reported accurately. Um, but then any hint that there might be a difference between male and female brains was just grossly extrapolated and interpreted in a way that reinforces gender stereotypes. <laughs> there are some differences between male and female brains. The main, most, you know, most clear one is that male brains are a few ounces larger than female brains, and the brain size does matter to some extent. Um, but the way we compare brains across species is usually to look at the brain to body mass ratio. How big is the brain relative to the rest of the body? Whales have brains way bigger than ours, but compared to their body size, it's not as big as our, we, we have a much bigger brain to body ratio. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Here? Homo sapiens, right? So this is how we usually compare brains by looking how big is the brain relative to body size. If we do that kind of normalization for men and women, it's about the same. Women may even be a little bit uh, higher brain mass to body. There are other differences that are well documented between male and female brains. Um, especially in the parts of the brain that control reproductive behavior. A lot of differences in the part of the brain called the hypothalamus involved in reproduction. But what we care about is are there any differences in female brains compared to male brains that can explain gender disparities in things like their representation in competitive jobs, and at least in my neighborhood this usually comes up in the tech uh, context. You know, is our brain, our women's brains just not wired for writing computer code? This is how the question is usually phrased. Well, I think the only responsible answer anybody can really give at this point is that we don't know because the brain is incredibly complex. Neuroscience is still a relatively young science. We're making rapid progress, but we're still working to understand how the brain does the most basic computations. We don't know how the brain Confused two plus two, much less what makes one brain better than another at doing things like programming the apps on the smartphone. Right? So we don't know what makes one brain good at doing these things. You know, computer science or running a Fortune 500 company, we can't say. And therefore, we have no basis for saying whether male brains or female brains are better for doing those things. We just don't know at this point. There's a difference in the performance of men versus women that has to come from the brain. Um, but the mistake people make is assuming if it comes from the brain, it must be innate. Because what we know from decades and decades of neuroscience research is that experience has an incredibly powerful effect in shaping the brain. Just one experience, one brief experience of a rat in a laboratory setting can produce changes in the biochemistry of the brain, changes in gene expression, changes in the strength of the synapses, which define the, the circuits that control our, our computations. With a little more training, over, say, hours to weeks, we can induce, we can see pretty big changes in the anatomy of the brain, big structural changes in the brain with just days or weeks of training. So now think about the brains of your average male and female college student. These male and female brains have had not just hours or days or weeks of experience, but we know from psychologists that they had, they contributed differently from birth. They had, by the time they get to college, two decades of different experience. Boys and girls are treated, and there could be a whole lecture series on this. <laughs> that might be another topic to cover. You know, boys and girls from birth are encouraged to do different things, they're given different toys, they're rewarded and punished differently depending on their behaviors. Um, you know, we make assumptions about the things that our boys and girls can do. And so, after decades of this experience, I have no doubt that the male and female brains will be different. Because we know 
that experience has a powerful effect in shaping the brain. So if the experience is different, the brain will be different. But we don't need to say that if it's different, that it's innate, because we know it could have resulted from the experience. And the same applies whether we're talking about ability or interest. There's been this shift in the, the dis this discussion or debate about whether there are any differences in male female abilities. Um, at first, people just said, oh yeah, boys are better than girls at math, of course. But when it turned out that on average, that doesn't seem to be true, the debate shifted a little. And they said, well, yeah, on average, they're about the same, but the distributions are different. The, there are more boys that are either very good or very bad. This was the, the argument that um, lost Larry Summers his presidency at Harvard, <coughs> that it was the distribution. Um, it turns out that the data don't really support that idea either. And so now when people talk about any differences, they tend to steer away from ability and talk about preference. They say, well, women just aren't as interested in computer science or math or um, you know, business or law or you know, <laughs> most of the things that people do in the world. And, you know, <laughs> and what can we do about it? You know, it's their choice. It's, it's just their preference. Um, it gets you off the hook for having to do anything. Um, but we know that abilities and interests, interests just like abilities, come from the brain and are powerfully shaped from it by experience. So if you take a rat in a cage and you shock it once when it's in one corner of its cage, it will avoid that part of the cage for a very long time. And we can find changes in the brain that are associated with that. Likewise, if you reward a rat or a mouse or any, any a human for doing certain things, you will create a preference for them to keep doing it. We don't say that's innate, we say that's, that's a learned behavior. So if we see differences in the preferences of men and women and we know their experience has been different, we don't need to assume that that's innate either. Okay, with well, all that in mind, I wanted to show you some brain images. Um, this is from a study where the authors looked at activation of the brain during a simple arithmetic task. And even for simple arithmetic, they see activation all over the brain. But what they're showing in this figure is areas of the brain where the activation was significantly different in the men versus the women as they did the task. And they found a few areas where there was greater activation in the men as they did arithmetic compared to the women. Now, it would be very easy, and, and it turns out that these areas, the inferior parietal sulcus and the annual gyrus are areas that have been implicated in doing math-y things. Right? So it would be very easy to look at these data and say, ah, uh-huh, see, yeah, I told you. Men are better at activating these math-y parts of the brain. That explains why they're better, right? That's not what the authors concluded, because when they looked at performance, it was the same. And so what the authors concluded is the women's brains are more efficient at doing that. <laughs> Who's right? Is it better to have more activation or is it better to be more efficient? Is it worse to have more activation? We just don't understand enough about how neural circuits work and what these brain activation patterns are reflecting about how the circuits work to be able to answer that question. I apologize, we're working hard in the lab. We just don't, I mean, neuroscience has just not yet gotten us to the point yet where we can answer this question. So I have to say we don't know, although I should point out that in favor of this women's brain is a more efficient idea, in some tasks, there's often brain activation that tend, that's there when you're first learning and tends to go away. But again, again we just, it's a possibility, we just don't know which is right. Okay, if we've gotten to this point of the conversation, with, if I've gotten it with most people and this hasn't come up already, they say, okay, yeah, 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 everything you said is fine. But isn't it really just about babies? You know, all of that stuff, fine, women are great, and then they have babies, and then they just want to stay home with their babies. So the last thing I want to tell you about is one that has really had a powerful influence in my thinking about this done by uh, two experimental economists, Niederle and Westerland, uh, who looked at this 
you know, uh, question where there's been a lot of speculation in the media, why do women pop down? So they tried to test this in a laboratory. They had two men and two women in a room, each working at a computer terminal, doing a bunch of arithmetic problems. And in the first round, they said, do as many as you can, and we'll pay for everyone you get, right? And the experimenters paid each subject, but nobody knew how anybody else had done. Then they said, OK, now we're going to do another round. You can choose. You can either do the same thing, just compete against the clock, or you can enter a competition with the people in the room. And whoever has the best score, if you have the best score, you get four times as much for everyone you got right. Otherwise, you get zero. So what do you think happens? The men choose to compete, and the women choose not to compete. But they also looked at how they had actually done, what their actual abilities were. They looked at how they had done in the first round. And they found that the women in the top quartile, so this is who had done the best, the best 25% overall in the first round, the women in the top quartile chose to compete at a lower rate than the men in the bottom quartile. <coughs> So here, the women in the very top of the talent pool are opting out, while the men who are, you know, struggling to print their name are opting in. <laughs> <laughs> so this study, it, I, I haven't seen it talked about or written about as much as some of the others that I've told you about tonight. But I think it's very important. I think it says a lot of things. First, it says it's not just about babies. There were no babies anywhere in the picture in this you know, hour-long laboratory experiment. It also shows that the opting out can't, be, can't at least totally be explained by women being less interested. They were going to do the same arithmetic problems no matter what. They, they were just going to do them. So interest in that doing that just didn't factor in, and yet they still opted out. Um, they also show that it's not that women are more risk-averse because if you put poor women in the room, they tend to compete at the same rate as the men. So um, it's that women have somehow learned to not compete with the men. Um, and most importantly is that it shows we are losing some of the very best talent. Even when the woman is the best one in the room, she's opting out. OK, so for anyone, male or female, there are two factors that are certainly shaping performance and the outcome and what you can do in the end. One is nature, your innate abilities. The other is nurture, how those abilities are developed. And if either one of these factors is different between men and women, the outcomes will be different. I tried to make the case that at this point, the science just can't tell us whether there's an innate difference in abilities or not. We just don't know. But there is overwhelming evidence that there is a difference in this other factor. Nurturing. Uh, sorry, the, the men are nurtured more uh, than the women. They're encouraged more. That if they happen to have a math ability, they're more likely to get the encouragement they need to really develop that. So it's my opinion that at this point in time, all of the debate about innate differences, which often involve just those stories about cavemen hunting, and that's why men are good at programming the apps on your iPhone. <laughs> from our obligation as individuals and institutions to address this, because we know this is there, and we know that it's influencing outcomes. So I think it's time for us to move beyond the denial, face up to the biases that we have, we don't like them, but we just have to acknowledge that they're there so that we can move on to solutions. So I want to spend um, the last time here talking about solutions. What is it that we should do? And we can look at this at several different levels. First is, what should women do to increase their chance of success given the biases that they're going to encounter? And there are a lot of resources about this. This is, um, is one of my favorites. It's from the Clayman Institute for Gender Research. They have on their webpage videos and discussion guides um, that are very well grounded in the research. Um, and so I urge you to check that out. But we should not think of this as a solution. 
Right? This is not a solution, this is a band-aid. We can teach our women to lean in all we want, all they want, um, but if we don't change how we respond to the women when they lean in, uh, we're still gonna have a problem. So I, um, just a story to illustrate this, I had read that the Harvard Business School was training offering training to its female students on how to raise their hand more assertively so they would get a call on because the tendency is teachers tend to call on the men more than women. So they were training them how to raise their hands. You know, not just like this, but... And so right after I read that in the newspaper, I, uh, I was in a seminar and I saw a very talented female grad student with her hands up and when it came time to questions, the seminar speaker picked, you know, chose all of the men around her. She was like in the middle. <laughs> and they were calling her. And she's brilliant, but a little bit timid, and I thought, I need to talk to her and teach her how to raise her hand more assertively. The next week, I was at the seminar, I had my hand up. I am not timid. I know how to raise my hand assertively. And twice, the seminar speaker made direct eye contact with me and then looked around the room and went all out more than that. So again, women can lean in, but we also have to change how we respond when they so what can we as individuals do to respond better to the women around us? Um, there's, there's several things. And, and again, the social scientists don't have all the answers yet, um, but they have enough information that we can start doing things that will move us in the right direction. Um, so the first is, I showed you some data that suggests that if you're not aware of your bias, it's more likely to control your behavior. And this suggests that raising awareness is an important first step. Um, so be aware of your bias, and then kind of look around at what you're doing and try to identify situations where bias is likely to be having its biggest impact. Is it when you're in your team meeting and the women never get to express their idea? Is it when you're offering up interesting opportunities to people in your group and you have to you know, make the extra effort to think of the women? Um, is it when you're hiring? So to, if you, as you become more aware of this, you can start to monitor your own behavior, notice where there might be a problem, and then sometimes when you mess up, like I still often catch myself doing, do a correction. Um, and this is helpful if you know where your trouble spots are. You can develop new habits or processes to counteract the effects of bias. Um, so you know, kind of the standard one is Bias has its biggest effect um, when you're under time pressure, when you don't have a lot of data, so you should slow down, be very deliberate, use your data, um, set your criteria in advance so you don't do that shifting criteria thing. Um, so you can develop habits, and some of them can be very simple. My department chair, knowing that people have a tendency to call on the men when uh, you know, everybody has their hands up, uh, he makes a point when he's giving a lecture to all the male females. So simple things like that can help to reduce the chance that you know, if you're distracted, you'll fall into the pattern of calling on them. Distrust your gut feeling. So your, your gut feeling is the thing that is likely to have you know, most of the effects of the implicit bias. Um, so if your gut feeling is telling you something, ask, well, you know, why is it telling me that? What are the data that are supporting that? Um, and you know, once you're aware of that shifting criteria thing, you'll start to hear other people and sometimes yourself saying very strange things, right? And so if you're, if you're listening, you can question, well, gosh, you know, one that sticks out in my mind is we were in a hiring committee and someone said about a very talented faculty, female faculty can, candidate, well, she's great, but she's just working in such a competitive research area. <laughs> and, well, okay, well, that, that makes it hard, but geez, you know, at Santa Fe Institute, do you want people working in competitive research areas? Yeah, right? And the other way of describing it would be a hot area. So, you know, people will say things that at first glance seem okay until you start to really think about it and it falls apart. Uh, so you can listen to those things. Um, what we can all do too is make a conscious effort to encourage and mentor and sponsor talented girls and women. Um, and I want to be clear that I'm not saying that women need more help and encouragement. I'm saying that we need more help to remember to offer the same encouragement to our girls and women that we work with that we naturally, more naturally tend to give to the boys. Um, and it's also worth pointing out the difference between a mentor who provides advice, and that's helpful, and a sponsor who actually creates opportunities. 
introduces the woman to some important people that can become part of her network, recommends her for an interesting position. And then uh, do your part to change the statistics of the world. The implicit learning system is constantly taking statistics on the world. I saw a scientist, it was a man. I saw a, you know, a teacher, it was a woman. Do your part to change the statistics. If you're a woman in a traditionally non-female role, make yourself more visible. I bring brains into my kids' classrooms and mention to the kids, oh yeah, I'm a mom and a scientist. You can do that. Um, if you are in the media, give us more images of strong female characters. We're still, uh, still very unbalanced in terms of um, the images presented us to, about women in the media. Like books, if you do art. Okay, so if we all work on these things, I think we can move the needle. But if we're going to reach 50-50 in our lifetime, then I think institutions really need to step up and do two important things. One is to provide social science expertise. There's evidence that bias awareness training, gender bias training can help, um, but only if it's done in the right way. And if it's not done in a way that's guided by the social science, it can actually backfire and increase bias. Um, so it's very important that your institution provide expertise, social scientists who can guide the work. Um, but we can't hand it off. We need to also create incentives for people throughout the organization to invest in sustained effort in developing and implementing interventions to mitigate bias. Even if we have a great training session or a few sessions, it's unlikely that that training is going to undo patterns that we've developed over our lifetime, especially when it's so deeply embedded in our culture. And so we need to incentivize sustained attention and effort to this issue. And if you ask most people, well, who in your organization is responsible for reducing the effects of bias, most people don't think it's that. They say, oh yeah, that's the HR office, or it's the university office, or it's the dean. Uh, people say things like, I'm a physicist, I split atoms, that's what the social scientists are supposed to do. But because of the way implicit bias works, um, the people in the diversity office can't solve it on their own, right? Because implicit bias works through the everyday interactions that happen throughout the organization in the normal course of business. So it's the woman getting interrupted when she's speaking, it's the manager failing to think of her when there's an interesting opportunity, it's the teammate who forgets to acknowledge her contribution to a project, and it's, it's these thousand small, what people call micro inequities that add up over time to have a big impact. And so the people in the diversity office can't be there for all of that. We need people on the ground, in the trenches, involved in the everyday core activities of our institution who are knowledgeable and willing to intervene. There's another reason we can't head it, just hand it off to the diversity office, which is that each group within an organization has its own microculture. And that affects how implicit bias plays out, where the biggest trouble spots are, um, and in a lot of the work we've done at Stanford, we've seen that the interventions are most effective if they're customized to the microculture of each group and aligned with their core values, whether that's research excellence or maximizing profit or helping people. Um, so you need people who know the local culture to work with the social scientists to design interventions that will be effective for that group. The role of the institution is to create Real incentives for people to do that. Incentives. Not just spare change, uh, because if the reward for contributing to one of the team's engineering projects is a promotion and a big fat raise, and the reward for reducing bias in the organization is a plaque and a gift card for some coffee, that's going to be a hard sell. Right? Some people, many people have said to me, well, People should just do it because it's the right thing to do. And that's true. I did it with a female colleague at Stanford. We took time from our own neuroscience research. We developed a number of programs. Jennifer went through them all. Um, and, you know, and we were having some success with that. And I hesitate to say this because it sounds like complaining, but I also think it's important to say it because it represents a fundamental barrier to our progress, which is that while we were taking time from our research to implement these programs for our trainees, 
We watched several male colleagues who had been focusing on their research get promoted ahead of us. Now, if I had the choice, again, if I had it to do over, I would make exactly the same choice. But it made us reluctant to ask any of our colleagues, especially our female colleagues, to invest their time in helping us to expand these programs so they would be available to more of our trainees. And when I put on the institutional hat, this doesn't seem like a sound strategy for promoting women in your organization. You don't want to promote the women at the entry levels of the pipeline at the expense of the women who have already made it further up the ladder. Um, so I think it's really, if, we, if we're committed to changing our organizations, we're going to have to have structures that allow men and women who are interested in working on this, part of their time, uh, create structures where they can do that without it adversely affecting their own career advancement. And that's not something you can do with your spare change, but I think it's quite doable. Um, and so, I have mentioned this. So one of the important projects I did as um, associate dean was work on what that kind of structure would look like. Um, we, I worked with a team, we designed this, we had all kinds of people, all kinds of input, lots of great people working on this. And we came up with something um, and, and piloted it that looks like it could work in a lot of different contexts. So if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to share information about that. Okay, if we're gonna ask anybody, individuals or organizations to invest in mitigating gender bias, promoting gender equity, we have to tell them what they're gonna get for that investment. And I think the best illustration uh, was that slide I showed uh, of the fact that we are losing the best talent. And when we find a way to more effectively utilize the full talent pool, including this large fraction of the top talent that we're now losing, we will all benefit. And there's quite a lot of data to support this idea. Companies with women on their boards are more profitable. Startup companies with women leaders are more likely to succeed. Companies are recognizing this, and, and companies like Intel are now betting on that, investing in that. Um, but it's not just about profits either. Um, when we lose these women, we're losing the work that they would have done uh, that could benefit all of us. We're losing the scientific discoveries they would have made that could have led to cures for diseases or our environmental problems or our energy problems. Um, they may have found solutions to social problems. We're losing the new products they would have developed that could be useful and enrich our lives. Uh, and we're losing the art they would have produced that could have enriched our lives. So finding a way to fully utilize the talent pool is something that will benefit all of us. It's a win-win proposition. And I will stop there and um, ask you to share your thoughts and questions. And I forgot at the beginning, I was supposed to mention, I hope you know, there were cards. And if you have questions, um, if you haven't written them on the cards, you can do so now. Uh, but we will start taking those. Um, and there's a lot of good intent. I think a lot of people really mean well. 
Uh, but we need to get more effective at engaging the men. I think a lot of men would like to engage, but they might not feel like they know how or um, you know, whether they're welcome. Um, but we're starting to see that too. Um, we're seeing it more at the, at the junior levels. A lot of business schools now have like men supporting women in business kinds of groups. Um, and, and a lot of male leaders really have um, a, a sincere interest. Uh, I think the problem is, and, and many of you are saying they value diversity. So I think that's the first good step. But when, also when you ask them to put a number on that value, like how much are you willing to invest, that number is rather small. Uh, not always, but often. Um, and I, I don't think we should kid ourselves that this pervasive social media, this pervasive issue that we're going to try to change can be done with our spare change. You know, when I put a few quarters in somebody's cup on the street corner, I don't kid myself that I'm going to solve the homeless problem. And I think it's going to take a significant commitment and effort to, to really have an impact. Um, but we're starting to see some, some companies step up and do that, some leaders. Okay, here's another question, and I all words on this one. With all the misinformation on the web, for example, how can we expect to overcome the pseudoscience that feeds bias? I, well, so what I'm going to do to try to overcome the pseudoscience is start sending out lots of emails as soon as I get home to these websites that I found, which I was just horrified. Um, but this is a real problem. It's not just, uh, you know, pseudoscience around bias. I mean, we see a lot of information or misinformation around scientific issues in this country as well, and mistrust of scientists. And, um, and you know, there are some great, resources, you know, there's some really reputable science columnists, science writers, um, and so you have to learn who those people are and, and stay away from the websites. But, you know, some of the websites, I was surprised there were websites that I thought would have been better. Great, uh, next question. Uh, this is one that I wonder about myself. Would it help to reduce bias if names were removed from residents in initial evaluation phases? And what other steps would uh, help reduce bias? Yes, that, it, to the extent that you can take gender out of the equation, um, that's a great thing to do. That's what the orchestras did. Um, often it's hard to do that um, throughout the entire process, but often it can be done at the first stage, like screening resumes. And in science, a big thing is we have peer review. We submit our scientific results to journals, and it goes out to some of our peers, and they review it, or we submit our grant applications, requests for funding, and it gets peer reviewed, it would not be so difficult to remove the names. It's amazing how much resistance there is to that idea. When I talk to editors of scientific journals, they say, well, you know, the reputation of the person matters. And I say, well, what if we first evaluate what's actually in the paper, and then there could be a second stage where you let the reviewers evaluate the quality of the investigator, and they say, well, no, I, I need to know that while I'm evaluating. You know, the science is supposed to stand, but they're so entrenched in this idea that they are, their process is fair already, and, and very resistant to change. But they're starting to be changed. So, so like the journal Nature, which is one of the top journals in science, now has the option to have your paper reviewed without your name. Another question, uh, very interesting. We are, as we talked about, we're losing our best talent because women aren't competing or choose not to compete. Uh, should we be questioning? system and thinking more about cooperation and stuff. Oh, wow. <laughs> if you want to take an issue harder than gender bias, I think it would be <laughs> removing competitiveness from our society and replacing it with cooperativity. But I, you know, I, I think there is, there is a little bit of movement. And I, I think the Santa Fe Institute is a good illustration, right, where um, you know, the, it's, science is becoming more and more, and, and lots of activities that we engage in are becoming more complex so that we need different kinds of expertise. And this is true in science, this is true outside of science. And so there's, just because of the nature of the work, we're going to have to be more collaborative. Uh, there is a question about how the US compares to other countries, sort of how, how we can compare yeah, the U.S. Is, is, you know, not the best, but not the worst. Um, so I have one slide up there showing, um, you know, that we're kind of in the middle on this tendency to associate science with men. Um, but we have a lot of room to improve. Um, uh, does the data show some
similar results with regards to job performance when men take on traditional female roles, i.e. teachers, nurses, daycare workers. Are male nurses considered more or less confident? Yeah, so there's some evidence for that, although it's less clear. So the, the results are a little bit more mixed. Um, you know, everyone does seem to take some penalty when they, they violate a stereotype. Um, but the penalty for men taking on traditionally female roles seems to be much less. Okay, there's a, I am female CEO, this is more of a comment, uh, but you can comment on the comment. I'm a female CEO of a solar company. I think women come out of woodwork to apply to my company. Uh, I think female promotions are a very strategy. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, the data suggests that women have the same biases and are as likely to rate the resume as less competent if it has a woman's name as the men. So um, I think the role of women in leadership positions um, is that they, they may be more interested and more ready to commit to taking steps. Um, but also they serve as a role model. And we know that that's a really, really important um, thing. Even having women on a hiring committee helps not because the woman is less biased, but because she serves as a reminder, if she's a success successful, well-respected person, that, hey, yeah, sometimes women can actually be good. <laughs> to the other members of the committee, you might forget if she's not there. So here's a request for an elevator speech. Uh, if you had a chance to explain implicit bias in 30 seconds to someone who uh, wants to support women in science but has not heard your lecture, what's the very still sort of way for someone in the audience to describe? I guess it's that although many of us really intend to be fair, trying to be fair doesn't always make it happen because we are unaware of a lot of the things that are driving our behavior. And so, uh, yeah. You can see my 30 cents was up. So African-American women are often perceived as being less feminine, whereas Asian women are perceived as being more feminine. So when a gender stereotype is, is being called up, sometimes African-American women aren't as hit as hard um, as the Caucasian women, although you know, certainly there are lots of other biases that come into play um, that put them at a disadvantage. But there, there's a very interesting interaction between the different biases that we hold about people. It's not just race and gender, but as I briefly mentioned, many different axes along which we make assumptions about people. Uh, so there's a question that kind of gets back to nature versus nurture in a slightly different way. Um, aren't men more competitive because of their testosterone? There are hormonal differences, um, and, but again, I think that, um, and certainly there are, Non-human species, you can, you can look at uh, ants and flies and things and crayfish. Um, and there are species where the, the men are more ready to fight, but there are also species where the females are more aggressive. And so um, it, it's, it's complicated. Certainly hormones influence behavior, but experience also influences aggressive behavior. Um, you brought up babies briefly, mm -hmm. but then Uh, well, as I mentioned, uh, mothers are perceived as much less competent than almost every other group. Um, you know, so just that subtle cue of uh, she's president of the PTA, so the president of the Neighborhood Association, it was like $11,000 less starting salary. And, uh, so I think, <laughs> I think pregnancy impacts people that way. I also think it, there's, there are very practical considerations. I mean, when two young people both have careers, I think this two-body problem is, is really one of the hardest problems to solve. I think a lot of the other things could be solved if we had the will and we were willing to invest. This two-body problem where you know, people need to move all over for their careers and find two great jobs in one place and compromise, I think that's the trickiest one. Uh, 
uh, here's another sort of innate versus nurture. Is multitasking really innate to the female? <laughs> oh, yeah. See, this is one of those things that I read on the web that made my blood pressure go. Where, you know, there's some evidence that the corpus callosum that connects the two sides of the brain uh, uh, made the, these commissures that connect the two sides of the brain may be slightly larger in women. Although, again, it's hard, it's, it's complicated to compare because the brains are a slightly different size. and that, So it's not even clear how big of an effect there is. But as soon as there's a hint of that, then people say, oh, yeah, they connect the sides of the brain, and that's why women can multitask, and that's why I'm never better at focusing on, you know, and, and analyzing. And it, it, we just have no neuroscience basis for taking, even if it is a, a stronger connection with women, and taking that and going to multitasking. We just don't know. Okay. And I'm going to use this as the last question, because um, I think it's a really important one. Um, what strategies do you suggest for uh, limiting um, or basically not reinforcing implicit bias or getting rid of implicit bias when interacting with young women? Okay, let me hold that one for one second because I didn't really answer the baby question and it does deserve an answer. So I, I think we need social structures that support young families and make it possible for two people to be working and to have good child care. And that's one place where the U.S. is way behind everybody else. Right? So we were in Spain, the school ends at 5 o'clock, people can have jobs and then pick up their kids at school. You know, simple things like changing the school day They're, they're and, and having good child care. So that's really fun. Yeah, they sure how to best influence young women. Young women, yeah, so I, I think trying um, to implicitly change their stereotypes by exposing them to female role models. Um, I tried to select from my, both of my kids actually, um, you know, books when they, uh, especially when they were young and I had some choice, uh, you know, books that featured strong women. Um, they're there, they're hard to refine. Um, and then, and then, like I said, I take brains into the classroom. I um, try to make sure both of my kids get exposed to a variety of role models. Great. Um, so please join me in thanking.